Though Mr. Choudhury had been so reluctant to take me, he once he did agree, he encouraged me and helped me in numerous ways, extending a sincere hand of friendship. <coughs> I worked very hard and wanted to prove myself to be as good as a man. So I did mainstream work. I didn't do women's work. <coughs> I did mainstream work such as company law, income tax law, complicated contract cases, and constitutional matters. Hardly the sort of thing that would immediately warm the cockles of the heart. I consciously avoided doing women's cases such as dowry, matrimonial, and custody matters. After a few years of practice, I was sent a brief by a Kaitan and company solicitors in a complicated company law and income tax matter to give an opinion. In order to preserve the confidenti confidentiality, it was often the practice not to disclose who had sought the opinion. So the brief came marked XYZ Company Limited Querist. I was very anxious to establish my competence and worked very hard on the brief and gave my opinion. I did not receive the small fee marked on the brief for quite a while and wondered what had happened. Many months later, the solicitor who had sent me the brief came up to me at a party and said, I don't know whether I should tell you this, but when I sent the opinion you gave in the matter to the queerest company, they were not at all happy. And they wanted a proper male opinion. They asked me why I had taken the opinion of a woman lawyer. I replied bluntly that I had taken the opinion of a good young barrister and was not concerned about her sex. When I heard this remark, I smiled, but was also a bit apprehensive and wondered whether I had indeed given the correct opinion. He continued, I then sent the brief to one of the best senior lawyers for his opinion. But I also sent your opinion along with the brief. It has just come back after a great deal of time. The senior barrister has only written a short note at the end of your opinion. It consists of a single sentence. Then he quote, after due deliberation, the best I can do is to endorse the opinion given. <laughs> I was relieved and very pleased. I also realized, however, how difficult it was for a solicitor to brief us young female lawyers coming up in the profession. But the client was happy that he had an authoritative male opinion, even though he had to pay 10 times as much as he paid me. <clears throat> My brother, who by then had become a senior executive in Andrew Yule and Company, sought my opinion informally on one of their legal matters. When I asked him why I was being briefed informally and not formally, he told me that the company would rather brief a male lawyer. I thought this was extremely unfair. He agreed with me, but said, all things being equal, fees, standing, ability, and expertise, almost every company, or man for that matter, would do what we have done. He added, it is only if you are equal plus that you can hope to make some headway. I realized then what I had to do. I worked very hard, but did not make too much headway. Though I was often despondent, I never stopped trying and kept on going regularly to the high court and attending chambers. I knew it was like having your own shop. The day you don't open it, would be the one day when the loan customer or client would turn up. When I think of the difficulties faced by me when I entered the profession, I remember the women, both in other countries and in India, who built some of the steps on which I have climbed. I think of their courage and determination and feel grateful and humble. In 1872, Mira Bradwell in the USA was denied a license to practice law. The argument made against her was that the paramount mission and destiny of a woman is to fulfill the noble and benign offices of a wife and mother. This is the law of the creator. 
She did not give up, and a few years later, her efforts resulted in the U.S. Congress passing a law in 1879 permitting women to practice before the Supreme Court. In 1914, in the UK, it was held in Bebb versus Law Society that a woman could not become an attorney. Basically, the reasons adduced by Cousins Hardy, the master of the rolls, and two other judges were these. Lord Cook had said three centuries earlier that a woman could not be an attorney, and he was the authority on common law. No woman had ever applied or attempted to be an attorney for a long time and usage was the foundation of common law. Finally, though the word person and not man had been used in the Solicitors Act of 1843, this did not expressly remove her disability. But five years later, the Sex Disqualification Removal Act 1919 paved the way for women to practice. <clears throat> in India, Regina Guha applied to the Calcutta High Court for permission to practice law in 1916 after passing her Bachelor of Law examinations. Her counsel argued before the full bench that the word person in the Indian Legal Practitioners Act, both etymologically and logically, would include a woman, especially in view of Clause 13 of the General Clauses Act 1897, which provided that in all acts of the Governor General and Council and regulations, unless there's anything repugnant in the subject or context, words importing the masculine gender shall be taken to include females. But her enrollment was refused by the judges on the ground that women were not fit for the hurly-burly of the profession, and that since no woman had ever been enrolled at the bar, they were not willing to make an innovation. In 1921, a few years later, Sudhanshu Bala Hazra applied to be enrolled as a pleader in the District Court of Patna after obtaining a degree of Bachelor of Law from the Calcutta University. She was in all respects a proper person to be enrolled unless debarred by the disability of sex. The judges referred to the judgment in Regina Guha's case and concurred with it. They said it would be repugnant to ideas of decorum to permit women to join in the rough and tumble of the forensic arena. But around the same time, the Allahabad High Court had admitted Cornelia Sorabji to practice law. And this anomalous situation was pointed out to the Patna High Court. In fact, one of the judges specifically mentioned that their refusal was not an aspersion on women's intelligence as such, but they required the legislature to intervene. So in 1922, Dr. H.S. Gore moved an amendment in the legislature of the United Provinces so that women would be enrolled without any ambiguity. He made an impassioned plea for women and also stated that the inns of court in England had reversed their earlier stand and were admitting women. It was a matter of human rights and not a special favor to allow women to practice. He withdrew his amendment on the assurance that the government of India would consult the local, local governments and the high courts on the question. The question was whether women should be as eligible as men to enter upon a career as legal practitioners. Thereafter, Act 23 of 1923 was passed and received the assent of the Governor General in April 1923, removing all doubts regarding women's right to be enrolled and practice. This was a little over 90 years ago. One of the first women to practice law in the Bombay High Court was someone called Mitham Lam. After she enrolled, she didn't get any work. After a while, she received a brief from a solicitor. She was pleased and surprised. But when she asked him why he had briefed her, he told her that his client had a case that he could not possibly lose. But he wanted his opponents to be further humiliated by the insult of losing to a woman. <laughs> Much has changed since then. There are many more women practicing law now, 
And I'm told that at some of the law schools, there are more female students than male. But even when women do well at their studies, when they come to the workplace, they are less confident and more fearful. This is because of the years of indoctrination that male opinions are better. At the time of present writing, 2015, there have been several women chief justices of high courts. There have been six women on the Supreme Court bench. But it is interesting to note that there has, more or less, been only one woman at any given time on the Supreme Court. I wonder how a male judge would feel and behave if he were the sole man among 30 women judges. <clears throat> a woman needs to feel empowered and as good as a man. And this can only happen when women are treated equally and paid equal remuneration for the same work as a man. Cheryl Sandberg, the chief operating officer of Facebook, relates an incident in her book, Lean In, of a woman economist being hired by the Standard Oil Company. When she accepted the job, her boss said to her, I'm so glad to have you. I figure I'm getting the same brains for less money. She was flattered by the compliment, but did not dare to ask for the same remuneration. Women have to remove the roadblock from their path, both mentally and physically, to become self-confident to succeed. As Eleanor Roosevelt said, no one can make you feel inferior without your permission. But the reality is that it is still men who are running the world, and this is more than apparent in India. Take the case of Bhavri Devi. She was a satin, a grassroots worker, in a village called Bhateri, working under the Women's Development Program of the Rajasthan government. She carried out a vigorous campaign against the evils of child marriage and prevented the marriage of a one-year-old girl. Consequently, in 1992, she was allegedly gang-raped. At the trial, it was asserted that not only was Bhavri Devi raped in order to satiate the lust of a few men, but also that humiliation was inflicted upon her because of her campaign against child marriage, which went against the feudal setup. But the district and sessions judge, Jaipur, acquitted the accused on the grounds that they were middle-aged men of good social status and well-placed in the caste hierarchy and therefore incapable of wishing to rape a lower caste woman. I am told that after the rape, it had been suggested to Bhavri Devi that she leave the village. However, she said, I have not done anything wrong and I will continue to stay in Bhateri. She was socially boycotted and her community ostracized her. Her in-laws and neighbors despised her and called her a shame to the village, as if it was she who had committed a crime. A lesser woman would have given up, but she fought it out. During her in-camera trial, she had to testify in front of 17 men. It was virtually a reenactment of the rape. She went through hell, and even after the unjust judgment, she was not ready to give up. She said, I will continue my fight till I get justice. How can I ask people to fight for justice when I am unable to get justice from the state, even though I am a government servant? And while justice has eluded Bhavri Devi, her courage has not been in vain. Following this case, the Vishaka guidelines came into effect in 1997 through a public interest litigation filed in the Supreme Court. And more recently, the sexual harassment of women at workplace Prevention, Prohibition, and Redressal Act 2013 was also passed. This, as its title implies, 